Even if the Bible is written by reliable eyewitnesses, 2,000 years is a long time for those original manuscripts to mutate, isn't it? So that's what I've been looking into in this video. Now the gap to worry about the most isn't actually all of the 2,000 years, it's the time gap between the original gospel accounts and the actual fragments of the early Bible manuscript that we have. I'm not worried about this, but I might be worried about this. Now there's a ton of fragments and copies out there, so we're gonna look at three important ones. And the third features this guy, Indiana Tischendorf, actually, it was Constantine, who did very exciting and possibly naughty things involving baskets, kindling, and ancient manuscripts. But the first one that we're gonna look at is this. This is the earliest gospel fragment. Look at that, how exciting. This is a little bit of John 18. It's called the John Ryland's Papyri. This is not the original, which is priceless and in a museum in Manchester. Uh, it's just my photocopy. But look at that. So that dates from about 130 AD, which is 40 to 50 years after the original was written. Now, another important one is this. This is the Chester Beatty Papyrus, or a bit of it, photocopied, um, which amongst other stuff contained Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts in one copy. It dates from about AD 200 to 250, which is 150 to 200 years after all the originals were written. And the third document to mention is this, Codex Sinaiticus. But to tell its story, we need to get acquainted with this handsome devil, Constantine Tischendorf. The year is 1844. Constantine is a genius academic and adventurer who at 29 years old embarked on a long journey in the East in search of ancient manuscripts. So, Tish departs Cairo and after 12 nights on a camel, finally arrived at the fortress monastery of St. Catherine's in Sinai, Egypt. There was no way in but through a shaft 30 foot off the ground. He was hoisted up in a large basket. Tischendorf searched their three libraries, but found nothing. Now, the next bit of the story is disputed. A bunch of monks say one thing and Tischendorf another. Let's hear first from Tischendorf. Apologies and advance again for my really fake bad German accent. I perceived in the middle of the great hall a large and wide basket of old parchments. And the librarian told me that two heaps of paper like these had already been committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find was a considerable number of sheets of a copy of the Old Testament in Greek, which seemed to be one of the most ancient that I had ever seen. The librarian let Tischendorf take 43 of these 129 leaves back to Germany. Later, the monks insisted the manuscripts were not destined for the fire. Anywho, time passed. Nine years later, Tischendorf returned, but no joy, he found nothing. And then again, six years after that, and again, no joy. Now he was about to leave when, according to Tischendorf, one night at sunset, the steward of the convent invited Tischendorf to his cell. Tischendorf continues, scarcely had he entered the room when he took down from the corner of the room a bulky kind of volume wrapped in a red cloth and he laid it before me. I unrolled the cover and discovered to my great surprise. Da, da, da. You'll have to wait for the second part of the story later on because I just want to pause for a second because even with what Tischendorf discovered, you might already be thinking, a handful of ancient documents, even really good ones, does not seem like a lot of evidence. Sorry, not suggesting you actually look like that. Although, if you did, that would be fine. Anyway, if you did think this, you'd be right. But there are loads more ancient documents and manuscripts than the ones that I focused on. In fact, by about 8350, there were 5,000 Greek manuscript copies, 10,000 Latin manuscript copies, and 9,300 other manuscript copies of the New Testament which were in circulation, which we still have today. But does that still seem like not a lot to go on? Well, to be fair, we should treat the Bible's documents the same way that we approach other historical documents. Let's compare the New Testament to Caesar's Gallic War. It was originally written by Caesar in BC 58 to 50, and the earliest manuscript we have is from Fleury in France, which is 900 AD, 900 years after it was written. In comparison, the New Testament was written in 60 to 100 AD, and the earliest manuscript is from 130 AD, which was 40 years after it was written. 
Now it seems fair to use the same bar of authenticity that we use for the Bible's manuscripts as we do for other ancient documents. So comparing Caesar's Gallic War to the New Testament, the age of the earliest copies, Caesar's Gallic War 900 years, New Testament 40 years. Number of ancient medieval copies existing today, Caesar's Gallic War 10, New Testament by AD 350 even, 25,000. So the question, is this the same text as originally written? Well, Caesar's Gallic War, the historians say yes. Well, if we apply the same rules to the New Testament, in this box, is this the same text as originally written? We really should say yes. So we've looked at some ancient manuscripts, but you still might be thinking, but there's still a 50 year gap between the gospels being written and the first manuscripts that we have. Isn't that a bit too long? Don't say don't do my research, but I have managed to secure some interviews with some guys who are doing cutting edge work in biblical textual criticism. These are real experts. Uh, and this is what they had to say to me. In my expert opinion, I would posit that a 50 year gap in between the first fragments and the original documents is not a problem. It was very important in Jewish oral culture to be able to accurately repeat and pass on information such as the Torah without mistakes. Two, the Jews were also super strict on the quality control of written documents, making sure every letter, word and paragraph were counted. They did many things like cross-checking the word in the middle of the page on line such and such was the same as on the page they'd copied from to make sure the copies were accurate. This is not a culture that puts up with sloppy copies of vitally important documents. Talking of sloppy, did I not request in my retainer to have a bowl of green jelly beans and a basket of kittens? And yet, nihil est. That's Latin, for there was nothing. Oh, that one's such a first part. Well, I'd say you need to consider the style the Gospels are written. They're consciously written as history, not as mythology or fairy tale like myself, to be sure. They were written with the explicit intent to be kept intact. Not like my stories that are written to be retold in different ways as a fancy take, see? Oh, oh, hee, hee. Sometimes I find these little fairy feet running about me pages make me ticklish. I either do. Hiya. Hiya. Well, in our expert eyeball opinion, the 50 year gap was short enough that eyewitnesses were still alive while these copies were made. So it would have been harder to include fabricated elements without dispute from people who were there. Hey, eyeball one, have you ever tried to touch your nose with your tongue? We haven't got a nose. Oh yeah, maybe that's why I'm finding it so tricky. The eyeball has a good point. But there's another niggling concern. Isn't it a problem that the earliest bits of the New Testament we've got are these itty bitty bits of manuscripts and not the whole thing? I put that to our experts. Well, actually, it's proof of reliability because if one tiny early fragment found in Egypt almost exactly matches that same passage in larger copies found in Israel or Southern Europe for later dates, it suggests the text was very reliable. And like you lot, still waiting for my kitten. Meow. He has a point. In a 250 year period, 25,000 different handwritten copies were made, thousands of miles apart in several different languages. And yet there's incredibly little variation in the New Testament text. Most of them are small spelling and grammar variations and the major ones you can all see because they're in the footnotes of the Bible. So for example, Acts 1, 15, it says, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers and then it's got a little note that the word believers in some alternative manuscripts could be brothers. But there's not a lot of major ones and none of them change the meaning of any of the major teachings in the Bible. Now, it's high time that we finished off our tale of Tischendorf. So Constantine was in the steward's cell and he was unwrapping something exciting in red cloth. I unrolled the cover and discovered to my great surprise other parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament complete. I knew that I held in my hands the most precious biblical treasure in existence, a document whose age and importance exceeded all the manuscripts which I ever examined during 20 years of study and research. After this, there was quite a bit of shenanigans about who got to keep the manuscript. Tischendorf requested to borrow the manuscript to copy it, which was eventually granted as a loan to the Russian Tsar who was funding Tischendorf's research. 
The manuscript to this day has never returned to the monastery and instead was eventually gifted to the Russians by the monks. And then, in 1933, Stalin sold it to the British Library, which is where you can find most of it today. Now, there's several things we need to say about this. One is, don't confuse the evidence for what happened in the monastery with the evidence for what happened in Jesus' life. So, in Tijendor's case, there was a dispute about what happened, and it was his word in his diary versus the monk who was there at the time. This is totally different to the evidence for the Gospels, which was collected from multiple sources and was witnessed in public events by hundreds of people. But what we are left with from Tischendorf's thievery slash heroism is this, Codex Sinaticus. Who owns it now and how it got there is still disputed. But what isn't generally disputed is this, that it's the oldest full copy of the New Testament that we have, and it's dated to about 350 AD. So I'm actually in London. Uh, had a quick trip to the UK to visit my mum and dad, and um, I thought I'd do a sneaky trip to the British Library while I was here. So I'm here to see Codex Sinaiticus. So here it is. Can you see it? Like it's a massive big book. Look at that. It's so cool. This page is Luke one. Yeah, and the writing is absolutely beautiful. You can see the ink. And it's super, super neat. And it just, I don't know, it looks like it could have been written like 10 years ago. Imagine this, sitting on a shelf in St Catherine's. The timeline I like, but I've just had a look on Wikipedia and everybody seems to disagree on this stuff. Well, if you go on Wikipedia, I can assure you that textual scholars spend a lot of time debating on this. But I want you to know that asserting that the New Testament is authentic and reliable isn't a crazy, flat earth, raving fundamentalist position. Lots of well-respected textual scholars of the New Testament think this also. For example, Sir Frederick Kenyon, director of the British Museum in the earliest 20th century said, the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. So is this knockdown proof that the New Testament is history and everybody has to become a Christian? You must become a Christian. Well, no, actually, it doesn't take a fairy tale leap of faith to say the New Testament is authentic. But actually, I think the main reason for trusting the New Testament documents and the rest of the Bible is because Jesus says they're true and the authenticity of the documents just backs this up. Ooh, I think I smell a circular argument here. You're right, let me explain. It's because if God really does exist and is the ultimate truth and power in the universe, then actually he's the only one that can prove himself. He has to be self-attesting. If there's a prior power or reason for us to believe in God other than what he says himself, that thing would be more powerful or primary than God, which would make God not God. It's mind-bending. God has to prove himself. It seems circular, and it actually is, by necessity. And then in practical terms, we need to listen to what Jesus says about God, and then acknowledge that we have been spoken to by God, or not. It's that simple. And for that, we need to read this, the Gospel. And if you're interested in finding out who wrote what when, and were they biased or were they trustworthy, then check out this video.